we're in Romans chapter 5. Last, uh, last week we were looking in chapter 5 also, but uh, verse 8 through 11, when we talked about we are saved by his life. And the, the emphasis that the Lord is trying to relay to you and I is our union with Christ. Uh, we, we sing some, some beautiful songs like always, but it just reminds me is that, is that, you know, the nature of God, if you don't understand this, even communion with what Nathan was saying, if you don't have a right understanding of God, right, you're going you're gonna to have a distorted view of how you relate to everyone else. And we know that God defines himself. He says uh, he is love so that all that he does for us all that functions in our life is a reflection of his love, even if it's his wrath. His wrath is not some unhinged anger. It's the passionate emotion for those that he loves. But he wants you and I to kind of live, or not to kind of, but to live as people who realize that because he, li- he saved us by his life and lives in us, now it's an expression of that life through us, that Moment by moment, no matter what we're facing, no matter what trials we're going through, that we live in union with him and we are not left to our own resources. It's a horrible mistake to think that the Christian life is limited to I pray this prayer and then when I die, I go to heaven. But in the meantime, hell on earth. No, he's saying, listen, I came to give you life. And so we're going through, and, and, and Paul is laying down some kind of heavy doctrine that we're going to look at. But to be an Adam is to know death. To be an Adam is to know death, and to be in Christ is to reign in life. So today, all of us are in one of two families. We're in Adam or we're in Christ. And so the question I wanted to ask you and have you ponder and meditate on today is, what is reigning in your life? What reigns over you, Adam or Jesus? Sin or salvation? Death or life? Because this passage isn't dealing so much with our individual sins, but with the guilt we received from the first Adam and the justification of life available to us in the last Adam. Through the entire passage, we see Adam as an individual contrasted and compared with the person of the Lord Jesus. So let's read verse 12 through 19. It's, it's rather long, but um, I, I, I think it's important to keep it in its context. Therefore, and what was the therefore? That we were saved by his life, right? We were under wrath and we were saved by his life. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, who was that one man? Adam, and death through sin, because the wages of sin is death. So, And so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespass brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who have received the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Well, Father, thank you for preserving your word for us. And I pray that 
you would speak through your servant's heart into the hearts of your beloved children. And Lord, I just, I just pray that if there's anyone here who doesn't know what it is to be in Christ, that they would open their hearts and receive the gift of abundant grace in you. And Lord, speak to us and move in us. And, and Lord, reign over our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So um, beginning in verse number 12, he says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through that one man, Adam, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. So this passage directly connected to verse 10 and 11 is that we were saved by his life. We were born under wrath uh, because of sin, but by faith we've been both forgiven and given the life of Jesus through his perfect sacrifice. So the, the, the bad news was we were all born under wrath. That was the bad news. We were all born sinners. Does anybody have any problem accepting that they've sinned? Now, I was thinking about this 30, 40 years ago. I'd go talk to people about, hey, uh, you know, do you know that, that you've been forgiven and, and that Jesus has saved you from your sin and, and heaven is your home and talking about stuff. And, and I hardly ever met anybody who didn't really readily accept, yeah, I am a sinner. Now, it seems like there's a lot going on in our culture where, you know, we've kind of redefined things to where we, we look pretty good in this deal. And we don't, want, we don't want to call anything sin anymore. Nothing's a transgression. But the reality is every last stinking one of you is born in sin. Born. With, and you inherited it from your father. Not your mother, but your father. <laughs> Mothers are off on this one, right? <laughs> he puts all the responsibility on Adam. He never blames Eve, so I don't know. Um, but sin came to all through Adam. We inherited a sinful nature from our great, 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 very great, 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 great grandfather, Adam. Right? Because he passed on to his children what he had what happened in the garden, which was sin. And he had children, and they actually began to... They were born in sin, and they all practiced sinning. That's why you understand nobody has to teach their children to sin. It just comes natural to them. Why? It's their father. And I was thinking about this. There's nothing worse than seeing your sin amplified in your children. All right? Because it seems like what I thought were just minor little imperfections my kids took to steroids. <laughs> but Adam and Eve, right, they were born in this perfect environment. And yet they chose to rebel against God. I I Eve was deceived, but Adam willfully disobeyed God. So it really wasn't the sum total of all of Adam's sins. But in the Greek here, it's the sin singular that started the whole problem. We all get focused so much in the church on individual sins because we think the problem is, well, it's the lying or it's the adultery or it's the, the greed or it's the covetousness. And we get focused on the individual sins. And in the church world, mostly what we try to focus on is managing those sins. But if you don't manage first or deal with the sin nature, there's always going to be all kinds of sinning. So from Adam, you know, one sin, he says, entered into the whole world. Sin entered through one man and then death through sin because the, the wages of sin is death. Now, in the garden, he had been warned that he said, like, listen, there, you freely eat. This is a perfect environment. And he said, you can eat all of these trees, all of the fruit of all of these trees, but there's this one tree here that you don't eat from, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Satan comes along and tempts him with the one thing that he's not supposed to do. 
And isn't it just weird? Once someone tells us not to do something, we have this great temptation to do it. Like, this happens to me all the time. Go to a Mexican restaurant, and I order my enchiladas. And the girl brings them, or the guy brings, the waiter or waitress brings them, puts them on the plate and says, don't touch this plate, it's hot. <laughs> no, I'm serious. It's like a mental defect right up here. As soon as he or she says, don't touch this plate, it's hot, I go, well, I'm retarded or something. You tell me don't, and I instantly go like, boom. It, it's a problem that's kind of ingrained into the way we were born. Now, maybe you don't have that problem, but now everyone knows that I do. So it, it, what we need to do is realize that the gospel really isn't about us focusing and managing the individual sins but realizing that there is an absolute necessity to move from the first Adam where we had a sin nature and we enter into the last Adam where we have a new nature. Because the answer to sinning isn't controlling the sins, but getting a new nature. That's why when Paul says, hey, listen, if any man be in Christ, he is a what? And he's saying, so like the bad news is that you were born a sinner and you sinned well. But your sinning didn't make you a sinner. This is what the church gets all backwards. The sinning didn't make you a sinner. You sinned because you were born a sinner. You don't have to train a dog to bark. Like if you come over to my house and you ring the doorbell, he utter chaos. Yep, 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 And they get themselves in this frenzy. And I yell at them, and I have a little spray bottle, and I growl at them, and, you know, whatever. It, none of it works. I could open the door, shut the door. The guy could ring the doorbell again, and it would still go off. You know why? Because they're dogs. My dogs are small. They have very small brains. They do dog stuff. Now, if one of you or all of you together would make the sound of a dog. Come on, someone help me. Make the dog sound. There we go. There we go. It's incredible that you. <laughs> I was listening. Are there any chihuahuas in here? Now, you just made the sound of a dog, but did that make you a dog? Now, it made you a little weird, you know, and if you find yourself doing this often, there are medications that will help. <laughs> but it didn't make, you didn't change your nature, did it? And see, the mistake of the, of the Christian church in many respects is they think that if they can change someone's behavior, they could change their nature and then change their destiny. And the gospel, what Paul's trying to get us to realize is, listen, the problem that you have at the core was that you were born a sinner and you need a solution to being born a sinner, not just dealing with your sins at the core of who you are. So from Adam, we inherit a sinful nature. And when Adam chose to rebel against God, then sin, it says, and death began to reign over his life. And this will always happen is if we live with the wrong mindset, with the darkened mindset that we are sinners by our nature, then sin and death will reign over our lives. And this is why I plead with you to recognize who Christ has made you to be so that you will know what is normal behavior and righteous according to your identity and what is abnormal behavior. Because even us can do some pretty strange things. We didn't have to wait to be born to be guilty. It is something that we inherited. And sin and death is universal to the human race. There's just no getting around it. You can go to Sri Lanka and, and uh, you know, they sin just as well. 
as they do here in America, and you can go to Canada or France or Germany or Africa or wherever you might think to go, and you're, you know there's no utopia. Why? Because they were all born in Adam. So he's saying, listen, they all were born in Adam, they all sin, were born sinners, and they were subject to death. And remember that death was an immediate physical death because remember he said the Satan's temptation was like, listen, don't you, you know, God's just holding out on you. You eat of this tree, man, and you could be like God, knowing good and evil. Oh, doesn't that sound delightful? I've always wondered about that. Like, what was Adam thinking? If you could live in this world, friends, and never know evil, wouldn't that be a good thing? Why would you want to be like God, knowing all, all that evil? And, and that's how quickly we're deceived, and how quickly you and I can be deceived to think that we could be like God. And only God is equipped to be the one who's going around saying, this is good and this is evil. And so all of us have this temptation to try and play the role of being little gods, judging what's good and evil, instead of living from the tree of life, which was the very life source of God. But don't you see how the power of one man's disobedience has the power to impact multitudes? One person's deeds in the garden had great power to affect the rest of humanity. And so his kids sinned, and his kids' kids sinned, and, they could, and you see this amplification of sin growing with each generation. But there's the beautiful part about God's love, is he never leaves us there. What did God do when Adam and Eve sinned? Have you thought about it? Like, did he just say, boom, and send a lightning bolt to, to obliterate them? This is the thing that's just so, like, mind-blowing to me, is this love that God has for us when we, were, when we were born sinners and we were sinning was he pursued us. He went into the garden even knowing they had sinned, and they were over there hiding and trying to cover their nakedness, and, and, and hiding and trying to make a leaves to cover themselves because of their shame. And, he, and the Lord comes to him and he says, where art thou, Adam? He knew where they were. What was he doing? He said, I'm calling them out. Now, were there horrible consequences for their choice? Well, absolutely. But what I want you to see from the very beginning, because this is so important, it wasn't separation for God for them, but man for God. Because God still entered into the garden, pursued them, sacrificed clothing for them, covered them, and remained in fellowship, stayed with them. Waiting for the time that the Christ would come. Death is the consequence of sin, but it's a spiritual death first and a physical death later. Then it could go on. He says, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law. So think about this. Before Adam and Eve sin, and then thousands of years come before Moses receives the law from Sinai, so uh, was there still sin? Now, if there's no law that you can, I mean, if there's no law, speed law, to drive down Main Street in Bernie, can the guy pull you over for going 45? He, he might, but... It's probably not wise to drive 45 down Main Street. But they can't really write you a ticket because there's no law. Now, let me tell you, there is a law on Main Street in Bernie for 30 miles an hour. And uh, I know by personal experience that they will write you a ticket. There is no mercy or grace in the Bernie PD. Very legalistic. What is he saying? He's saying, listen, before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. So why do we develop laws but to identify dangerous and destructive behaviors? Look, and look what happened in, uh, you know, last week where they had this shooting in El Paso and then in Dayton. And then the predictable response by the politicians was, you know what? We need more laws. 
we need more laws. And maybe some more laws would be good. But you know what? Laws are never going to deal with the core issue of the problem, and that's the fallen state of man. You can, you know, and then here's the thing about sinners. They don't obey laws. I mean, you even look at the foundation of the country. He's saying, listen, this constitution that we're writing was only for a moral and righteous people. So you can, you know, you can create one law after another law after another law trying to deal with these dangerous and self-destructive behaviors, but you, the, the, the only answer is really Jesus. Things can be wrong without a law telling you it's illegal. And I love that in communion, what are we telling them? It boils down to two things. Love God with all of your being and love your neighbor as yourself. And here's the deal, friends. If you don't love, allow God's love to fill and penetrate your heart and mind, poor neighbor. Because we live in a world where a lot of people say, listen, I'm born again, I'm going to heaven when I die, and are mean as the devil in life. Because they think God is out to get them. And so they're out to get everybody. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even those, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. So what do we see? Death reigned over all men prior to the law being given. Death reigned because sin was active in all mankind prior to Adam and the giving of the or I'm sorry, the giving of the law. The fact that death reigns over all proves that God judged everyone in Adam. Adam had one commandment, Adam blew it. And everyone after, but Adam was a type of Jesus who would come to undo the destruction of Adam's sin. They died because they had sin in Adam, not because of any individual sin. But here comes the good news. So the, you got to hear the bad news before you get the good news, and the good news is really good. And he says, what? But the free gift is not like the trespass. Do you see it? This is the thing about a gift, friends. So you're here and you're not sure what it means to be born again or to have your sins forgiven or heaven as your home. And you're sitting here going, what is this guy talking about? I'm telling you, man, there is nothing you can do, no work you can earn, no check you can write, nothing you can accomplish through your own self, no reformation of your character that you can accomplish in order to, to, to receive life. It is the free gift of Jesus Christ. And it was brought to many. He says, in, for if many died through one man's trespass. Now, offense or transgression is from the Greek word peripatoma, which has the meaning of straying from the path or missing the mark. Going where one should not go. Adam and Eve, we talked about it, had one command, which was to not eat from the tree of knowing. And this is where we get stuck because we still have this temptation to spell, spend all of our energy and effort in what we know. Like my theology is better than your theology, my thing than your thing, and it's all about what we know. And <laughs> even the Pharisees were living like this with Jesus. It was all about what they knew. But here, this is the wrong tree. He's saying, listen, by grace, listen, by grace, we, we have received the, the gift. And what is a gift? It's something that you receive. It's a gift of grace, so it means it's unmerited. You and I receiving into ourselves the very life of Jesus. He said you're saved by his what? By his life. And where does he live? He lives in you so that when you, when you come to church on Sunday morning, his life in you can be a spring full of joy that, that, that brings praise and worship to him. But on Monday morning, the same Jesus is living in you for the workplace. For the teacher in the school, for the student in the school, for the guy working in an office or driving a truck or the accountant or the oil. It doesn't matter. He said, listen, I am left you to your own resources. I gave you my life as a gift of grace. 
For if many, man, many died through one man's trespasses, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. I mean, what a gift. Apart from works, apart from the law, apart from ordinances, apart from Christian rules and principles, apart from worthlessness, an out and out gift of righteousness from God. You know, most Christians I know, at least in my experience, even in, in, in ministry in Christianity, was I never felt righteous. I knew that heaven was my home. I knew that in some way my sins were forgiven, but I never felt righteous. Because I didn't know I was a saint. I thought I was a sinner saved by grace. And so I kept barking like a dog. I kept sinning like a sinner. I didn't know that I was a saint. I didn't know that I was righteous. I didn't know that I was holy. I didn't know that I was complete. And when God started to remove the scales from my eyes and the darkness left, all of a sudden I realized, listen, heaven isn't just a place I go to when I die. Heaven is now. He did this by the grace. It's a free gift of grace. And he said it is abounded. It's, the idea is, listen, it's available for all of humanity. He did this, right? He didn't do this for a select group of people. He did this for all of humanity. Even John the Baptist sees the Lord coming, and he says, Behold the Lamb of God, who does what? Who taketh away the what? No, just American. He, he meant Americans before there was America. He did this for who? The world. And look at this language. It's just incredible, friend. It abounded for many. And then he says, and the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. Adam's sin and its consequences were passed to, on to us all without exception. But Christ and his obedience is, and righteousness is passed on to all who believe in him. You see, what God did for all mankind becomes a personal experience or a subjective experience when we choose to receive the gift. Because he doesn't force his love on anybody. But there's nobody he didn't do it for. He won't force you. You can sit here and come to church every week and never put your trust in him. He'll never force you. But he pleads with you. He's calling you. Christ's obedience and righteousness is passed on to all who believe. So is righteousness something that we achieve or is righteousness a gift that we receive? Some of you had the right answer. The majority of you were noncommittal, like it was a trick question. Would I do that to you? Yes, I would. Are you righteous? So, this, why is this important? So, does sinning make you a sinner? Oh, you know how we talk. You lied. You're a... Uh, oh, you're a liar. Liar, 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 pants on fire. You're a liar. You steal. You're a... Ooh, horrible. You kill someone. You're a... And you bark? <laughs> You're just a dirty dog. Just a dirty dog. No. I understand the logic because we think behavior determines identity. The behavior determines nature. But you're no dog. And you're no sinner. Can you sin? Yes. Can you act freaky? Yes. Can you do things that are strange and contrary to who Christ says you are in him? Yes. But your identity is secure and you are righteous, not because you did righteous works. You're righteous because of the gift of God's grace. And that changes how we live in the world. 
Adam's one sin was not o- the only one that Christ died for. Adam, having become a sinner, sinned many more times before he died. But Christ died for the sins of all who believe. And then look, he says, so for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. And this is what happens to us when we trespass, when we sin. It's all of a sudden, as the death begins to take hold in our consciousness. And you know, the condemnation is really all about what we do to us and what we do to each other. Now, that, that condemnation is painful. Have you ever felt shame for anything you've done? I have. And, you know, there was a period in my life, you know, I don't know what happened. I, we, we, you know, I don't know who to blame for it. But I had this kind of teaching in my mind that, man, when, when, when you felt guilty, then you ask God to forgive you. So I had committed some sins in my youth, and I'd be like, it would come to my mind, and I'd be like, oh, Lord, I, that was really bad. Could you forgive me? And then I might feel a little forgiven, and then later on, the, the fiery dart from the enemy would come, and all of a sudden, I'd start feeling guilty, and I'd say, Lord, I did this, and, and can you forgive me? And, and on and on and over and over, because I had a sin consciousness that reigned death in my life. And I wasn't free to love people because I was so living in the condemnation. This isn't God condemning me. This is my own conscience condemning me. And I'm confessing, Jesus, you remember when? And he's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Why? Because he's chosen to remember your sins no more. The only one who wants you to live under death, condemnation, shame, is the enemy. He's reminding you. Not God, and you need to reject the lies that he brings into your thinking. Because we aren't meant to live. God, God, God has dealt completely and fully with all of our sins in the last Adam. By the gift of abundant grace. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. So do you see it? What is it again? He's emphasizing it's a free gift. And so you need to let God remove the scales from your eyes and open your heart and your mind to realize, you know what? I'm right with God because I've received the free gift, not because I always do the right thing. Are you right with God? Oh, come on. You guys want to go to lunch today or tomorrow? I'm not the one that determines how long this sermon is. Your responsiveness is, are you right with God? Yeah. Now, do you always feel right? No. And do you always act right? But you didn't get right by doing right. You get right by receiving the gift. Yeah, thank God. And give God a hand because it isn't about us getting better, doing more, and trying harder. It's about what he has done and the declaration, it is finished. And that makes us righteous and changes the way that we live in the world. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man. So the idea of reigning is to, to, uh, is to reign or to rule or to have dominion or to have power. And I wanted to ask you this morning, really seriously, would you really consider what is reigning over your life? Because a lot of people I know, they're born again and their sins are forgiven and death's still reigning over their life because they're living a sin-conscious existence. They're allowing the past failures, the fiery darts of the enemy to keep them in bondage. And we think it's like a part of our humility. But see, listen, it's really pride because it's focused on us, success and failure. Humility is really us coming to the place where we accept that it's all about Jesus. And when it's all about Jesus and I experience his love for me, I can release that love to my neighbor. And so that death doesn't reign over us. 
And sin doesn't reign over us. Look, he says, um, for, he, he said, for because one man's trespass, that was Adam, death reigned through that one man. And then look what he says. Much more will those who receive, look at what it says, the emphasis is what? Those who receive the what? The abundance of grace. God has what kind of grace for you? Unending, overflowing. And you know what? I need it, and you need it. <laughs> a couple years ago, someone was complaining. I talked about grace too much, and, and then a friend of mine came up to me and goes, you know, Tim, it's, there's a saying that preachers preach on what they need the most. <laughs> and I'm like, cool, because I confess you know what I need? I don't need a little portion of grace. I don't need just enough grace to get me started and leave me to my own resources for the rest of the journey. You know what I need? I need abundant grace. And if you're self-aware, you need abundant grace. And the dangerous people are not the people who know they need abundant grace. It's the people who don't know how desperately in need of the abundant grace. Those are the people are heaping condemnation and death on others because their performance isn't as good as theirs. Listen, it's abundance of grace and the free gift. You see, he says it over and over again. Why? Because we just have this, this propensity to think, I've got to deserve this. I've got to be worthy. I've got to earn it. And if we have enough money, we think, I can buy it. And he's saying, nonsense. You can only receive it. And he says, let the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. <coughs> what are you allowing to reign in your life? Death or life. You see, you go through the day and you say, you know what? I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm loved. I'm accepted. I'm complete in him. You know what's going to change in your attitudes and actions? Everything. Everything. You go through life and you say, you know what? I'm no good sinner saved by grace. And that guy's even worse. And that one over there, that, you know, and we start pointing out people, and what, what happens in our existence? Death. Death. And he's saying, people, you've been born again by the Spirit of God. You've received Jesus Christ as your Savior. He said, listen, let the free gift of righteousness reign in your life. Let the free gift of righteousness rule over your thinking. Let the free gift of righteousness rule over the way you live. Let the free gift of righteousness be the determining factor in how you give and how you spend and what you do and how you live in the world. Let the free gift of righteousness reign in life through who? The one man, Jesus Christ. You know, weren't, weren't we singing about Jesus being here? Or was that first service? One, of, one song, I don't know, my mind's already forgotten which service it was, but we're talking about, man, Jesus, he's here. You never have to wonder, is Jesus there? Because why? He put his spirit in you. So you go to work and you got heavy decisions to make and you need wisdom from God. You know what? You got wisdom from God because why? Jesus is here. And if you think you earn righteousness to be righteous, you'll always be in an in and out relationship with God. But he says, this is a gift that we receive through Jesus Christ. He lives in us. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, it all, it all started with Adam, and the result was universal sin, universal guilt, universal condemnation, and in the end, universal death. That's the bad news. And here's the good news. So one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for some men. I wanted to see if you were paying attention. Some men or all men? Even you? 
Even your neighbor. Even your enemy. Eh. Eh. Because this is where we get a little sticky. There's some people we like, no, uh, 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 not uh, us. Yeah, okay. But that one, mm -mm, no. Mm -mm. Too much pain they caused in my life. They will suffer condemnation and death. And then we play this game of grading who is the more worser sinner. And it's no such game to play. Listen, have people wounded you and hurt you and caused damage to you? Yes. But if you live in that consciousness, then sin and death will reign over your mind and your thinking and affect all of your actions. I mean, the way that we're wounded in life, this is the, what I, it took me years to get this one. I, I, was, I was walking around like an angry guy waiting to get angry because I was mad I'd been molested as a kid. And what was I doing? I was letting some demon in my past dictate how I lived in the world and sin and death reigned in my life, even though I was going to heaven and preaching the gospel. When I released them of all that harm they did to me and forgave them, all of a sudden the lights began to shine in my brain again. And it really wasn't about the sin they did to me, but I could allow God's life to reign in me. And he wants to reign in you. We talk about Jesus being Lord, but most of us don't experience what it is for Jesus to be Lord of our life because we still live in condemnation and death. We still think we know what's best for us and we got to protect ourselves. And he's saying, listen, let me reign. Let me rule over the way you live and how you act and why you spend and where you go and what you do. Let me be there because I live in you and all I desire is to manifest my life through you. And he said he did this not just for you, but for all men. Salvation is a gift that comes through his righteous act on our behalf. He became our representative so that in him, not only do we have a brand new future, but we have a brand new past. Now, someone say amen. That's good. And you're all sitting there looking at me like, I just hope he's done. <laughs> just hope he's done. Well, I'm not. Here, listen. How are you going to live? You see, most of us, this is why I want you to really, you have a new past. So if, 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 if it was a line, right, like Adam and then, you know, his kids and his kids, 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 other kids, and there was a direct line, you know, all the way to you. And they all sinned and you all sinned and you've got this past, right? Anybody here have a past? Oh, come on. All of you got a past. We can Google your past now. <laughs> we can find out about you. I, I hope not. <laughs> anyway, yeah, but you can find a lot about someone, but we all got a past. And how we have this past, the, the things that we did wrong, the things that were done wrong to us, all affecting how we live. And we live in death, and, and death reigns over our life. And then we come to Jesus. And most of us think, okay, from here on now, I'm still in this line. I, I'm still in the line of Adam. I'm still a sinner, but I'm getting to go to heaven when I die. But what happens is he takes us out of the first Adam, and he places us in the last Adam, so we are disconnected from our past. And all we have is a new future. Don't let your past enslave you in death and condemnation. He loves you. He has dealt with your sin. How many of you ever heard that sermon? The famous, uh, was it Jonathan, uh, was it Edwards? Someone like he said, the sinner in the hand of, uh, sinners in the hand of an angry God. Have you heard that one? <sighs> Scary. That guy had a gift of scaring the hell out of people. I mean, there's stories that people's fingernails would be like driven into the, the wood. And I was talking to my friend this week, and I, I don't know, some of you are going to think I'm a heretic, but it's okay. 
And I was talking to him, and I said, you know, I just, I don't think that's the way it is. I don't think that God came unhinged and was just waiting to destroy mankind. I don't think God's anger was like what we think of when we think of our anger. I think the redemptive story is not, not sinners in the hand of an angry God. I think the redemptive story is God in the hand of angry sinners. Because it wasn't God the Father who nailed the Son to the cross, nor tore his flesh, nor mocked him or scorned him. It was sinners. It was God releasing himself to all of the anger and vile sin that mankind could pour out on him, and they hated him. And he took it all. He took it for you, and he took it for me. He took it all so that he, by one free gift, could declare us, by the abundance of his grace, righteous and justified to give us life and to make it available for all of humanity. For as by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. Were we all born into this world sinners? You betcha. You betcha. But that's not the end of the story. So by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. The choice between two is before us. The first is Adam, sin, guilt, condemnation, death, and the last Adam, forgiveness, righteousness, and abundant life. The guilt of Adam's death disobedience was imputed into all of his children and Christ's obedience causes all those who believe in him to be made righteous in the sight of God you got to come to the place this morning or I hope you'll come to the place this morning where you realize that what one man does I mean one man one woman human humankind has great power to affect all of humanity my disobedience can make a mess, and my obedience can change the world. I started thinking about this, you know, as I was getting ready for today, and I was like, you know, Lord, I can't even change me. How can I change the world? He says, just obey me. Just obey me. And you know, I, I just sit there and I think, you know, listen, I don't know, I don't know, I mean, does anybody know how much time they have left? I don't know. But I want every day, every week, every year to make a difference in the world as he reigns in my life. So where he says go, I'm going to go. And what he says give, I'm going to give. And what he says do, I just want to do. I want to give yield and surrender because I want to experience my life, experiencing his life. And I want my family and my children and my grandchildren I want them to experience that and I want Sri Lanka to know and everywhere God lets me go in this world you say pastor why do you keep going all these places because I just want to obey him I just want to obey him I just want to experience life and I want others to experience life okay 12 o'clock I'm sorry <sighs> every week I say I'm going to stop on time Adam brought sin, guilt, condemnation, and death. That's what Adam brought us. And you can sit here and you can refuse that, and uh, God's not going to force it on you. But have you said yes, Jesus? Because Christ offers us a life of reigning in his abundant life. Too much time wasted on going to heaven when we die and not experiencing his abundant life today. Now, listen, I want to go to heaven when I die. I don't know. Like, are there streets of gold or is that a metaphor? One street? We all got to live on the same street? Mansions, right? The Americans, man, we all going to have a mansion in heaven. We're going to have our place in the dominion transferred to heaven. 
I, that's not what the Greek says. It actually says that the word mansion is the old English word for rooms. He goes, I have a room for you. Don't be disappointed if you don't get the Dominion Mansion and just have a condo with Jesus. <laughs> but my point really is, listen, let him reign. Because he wants to reign over you. Not condemnation. Not de- so when the, when the enemy attacks you with thoughts of past sins and failures and transgressions and mistakes and lost hopes and what, whatever he comes at you with, just say, listen, I'm sorry, but you're confusing me with the old person. I'm in Christ. And I have a brand new future and a brand new past. So who's going to reign over you today? It's your choice. Father, we choose you. And we know that somehow you chose us, and I don't know how it all works. But we choose you. And we thank you for this abundant grace that forgives our sins. And Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here who doesn't know for sure that heaven is their home, but heaven living in them, you living in them, that today they would say, yes, Jesus, I receive your abundant grace. And I thank you as a gift. Lord, work mightily in us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.